worked uh, on different things. Uh, he's worked on neural networks. He's also uh, and, and deep learning. He's uh, worked on uh, large-scale um, online uh, uh, convex optimization and fast algorithms for that. Um, and um, so he's he's been a researcher at uh, Microsoft Research Cambridge, and then he's been a researcher in the Sierra Group at uh, INRIA, and now he is, uh, has a position at uh, Criteo, and he's a scientific program manager. Nicola. Does it work? Yeah. Okay, so it's always difficult to speak after Jan, so I'm thankful for the organizers to have put a coffee break in between. Uh, so it's not going to be as obvious. Um, I think, actually, a lot of uh, what Yana talked about uh, is going to help put what I'm going to talk about in perspective. Um, so what does Credio do? Uh, probably most of you don't know what Credio does. Um, it's an advertising company. We buy advertising space on websites. We display ads for our partners. And we only get paid if the user clicks on the ad. So we take the risk for the advertiser. Uh, how do we buy advertising space? Uh, most of the time, it's an auction in real time. So there's an auction, some kind of an auction house, which asks all the companies like Credio to how much they want to bid for buying this advertising space. And then the winner um, gets, the, uh, gets the advertising space and pays the second price. And game theory tells us that in that setting, the optimal strategy is to bid the expected gain of displaying an ad on that space. And it so happens that the expected gain of an ad is how much we are being paid per click times the probability that the user is going to click. All this to tell you that at the core of what Credio does is estimating the probability that the user is going to click because that's really that what's determined our bid. If we bid too low, we do not buy as many displays as we could and we lose money. If we bid too high, we actually buy displays that are not uh, financially interesting, and we also lose money. Uh, once we win the display, um, so we've decided we're the one who get the advertising space. We know which advertiser we're going to display an ad for. Then we have to choose the color of the ad, the font of the text in the ad, the layout of the ad, uh, and then generate the, the, the whole banner. Um, so it so happens that we display more than 2 billion banners per day. Uh, but actually, the interesting part is this, and that's uh, what's going to be slightly different from what Yan presented. Um, whenever a user, so every time a user goes on a website, uh, we can display an ad. The RTB uh, company calls us, and basically we have 100 milliseconds to reply how much we're willing to bid for this. So we have 100 milliseconds to do a prediction. The problem is, out of the 100 milliseconds, we lose about 15 network time in between them and our data center. Then we lose another 10 milliseconds in doing some parsing and logging data, another 35 milliseconds in other competition, extracting variables and everything. That leaves about 5 milliseconds to do the actual prediction. And within that 5 milliseconds, we have to predict for each of the advertisers in our catalog how much an advertising space is worth for them so that we can pick the best one. And that's about 100 on average. So that means for prediction, we have about 50 microseconds. And that's basically the major difference with what Jan presented. Um, he had actually a very nice picture of uh, the visual cortex. And you could see that the time between um, you had uh, your senses you captured the signal and you had the reaction, it was about 150 milliseconds. So it's about 3,000 times slower than what we have to do. And all the visual um, recognition tasks I think you're in between maybe 20 and 60 frames per second. So you're on the order of, let's say, 30, 50 milliseconds to make a prediction. So again, it's a thousand times slower uh, than what we actually need to do. So what does that mean? Uh, there was a shallow versus deep, uh, more time versus more memory. Uh, in machine learning, there hasn't been actually that much interest about the prediction time. There's been a huge shift when we move, from, say, from SVM uh, or k-nearest neighbor to neural networks because suddenly the prediction time didn't scale linearly in the number of training examples anymore. And that was great because the size of the data set kept increasing. 
But beyond that, uh, as Jan put it, most of the effort has been spent in reducing the training time because that's, that's weeks and that's usually much more critical. In our case, training time is actually definitely not as big an issue as prediction time. So he said that basically 50 years ago we had encrafted features and that we had evolved a lot since then. Well, I'm taking you 50 years back because that's pretty much the only thing we can do. So once we have that, that's a fairly simple model, you have two possibilities. Either you take existing state-of-the-art models like deep learning and you try to make them fit into 50 microseconds, or you start from 50 years back, which do fit in 50 microseconds, and you increase the complexity. So you do exactly what's been done before, except now you have prediction time in mind. Okay. And that's pretty much what we're doing. So it's the same set of techniques, except in our case, uh, we always have to think about how to increase the complexity of our models while keeping prediction time reasonable. Um, so that's basically a very simple model. Uh, probability of click, of course, is a function of the variables we extract and the parameters of the model. Um, and then, so for instance, the features would be how, long, how much time has passed uh, since the last visit of the user on that particular uh, merchant's website, uh, what is the advertiser, or what is the current URL. Now you realize that already there's an issue. Uh, current URL, that means that the model has one parameter for every possible URL on the web. And that's a bit of an issue, uh, because though we do have a lot of data points, we do not have as many data points as there are uh, like combination of URL advertisers or time since last visit. So we're going to do hashing. And uh, Jan mentioned uh, random matrix theory. Again, these are techniques. Uh, what's hashing? Well, hashing is a fast dimensional reduction technique. So you know about PCA, LLE, isomap. You have a whole lot of dimensional reduction technique. You have supervised dimensional reduction technique. The problem is they're too slow in real time. Again, it's the same problem. So what we do, hashing, is a dimensionless reduction technique. It's not tailored to the data, though, but it's super fast. It's, it's almost uh, directly implemented on, on CPUs, and you can do that extremely efficiently rather than a matrix vector product as standard linear dimens uh, dimensionless reduction techniques. But again, we build from the, from the ground up, so now you can also improve the hashing. Uh, you can do multiple hashing. So a huge line of work in our setting is basically how to improve these techniques while keeping the prediction time uh, small. Uh, learning the parameters. So Jan mentioned a lot about uh, learning the parameters. So we have about a billion uh, data points in our data set uh, and about 10 million dimensions uh, for, for, reason, for, for the big models we have um, at Creo. So theory tells us, or everyone tells you, that stochastic gradient methods should be used because they're so much faster than batch gradient methods. Uh, and you'd be silly not to use them. And the only issue is that, well, in our case, not all points are equal. So when Yan has a data set of image, it's likely that pretty much every image contains the same amount of information. In our case, sadly, people do not click on ads as much as we'd like them to. So when you have your one billion lines of logs, you only actually not have, you don't have that many lines that yielded a click on the ad, and you have a whole lot of lines that didn't yield a click. And knowing what yielded a click is actually much more important. So if you want to ha use a faster method which allows you to treat more data points, it's good, but these extra data points don't bring as much information as the previous one. So what you usually, there was a paper by Olivier Bousquet and Leon Boutou on the trade-off, uh, between stochastic and batch, uh, treating more data points v versus doing a better job on these existing data points. In our case, it's actually interesting to do a better job on a smaller set of data points. Also, we learn these m models on a cluster, and stochastic methods are harder to parallelize. Uh, it's not impossible. Uh, people are looking into it. We're looking into it. But it's definitely much more complicated. Uh, so our optimizer, just to give you an, an idea, so we use a batch optimizer, distributed learning, and we learn about 10 million, well, we can process about 10 million examples every second. Uh, again, uh, we can say that, but as I said, offline learning is not the issue, prediction is the issue. Now, learning the features. Um, well, most of you came for Yan, so most of you came for knowing how to learn the features. Uh, so that's another way of, of learning the features. Uh, our basic model, as Jan mentioned, is a linear model. 
uh, it was there was a perceptron, there was logistic regression, uh, and a, like a linear SVM, linear regression. You have a whole bunch of linear methods, and they're extremely easy to train, and also extremely it's extremely easy to compute in prediction in real time. The problem is a linear model. You cannot use higher order information, and what, that's what neural networks have all been about: is by learning how to combine lower level information into higher order information in order to better predict. So in our case, for instance, if the current URL is Disney.com and the advertiser is Guns for Life, it might be that the average click probability on this combination of two cannot be immediately deduced from the average click probability on Disney.com, which may be fairly high, and on Guns for Life, which may be fairly high. But the combination of the two, the click probability might actually be super low because there's very little overlap between the, uh, the people who browse Disney.com and the people who buy guns. Um, so how do, you, how do you model this higher order information? How do you build these features? Uh, so you can do handcrafted features. Uh, you can fully learn them. And again, handcrafted features, you don't have as many representational power as you'd like. And when you fully learn them, then it's too expensive to recompute them in real time. So we have to navigate in the space of feature transformation that are fast. And such a space, for instance, is uh, the polynomial kernels. So you can do a polynomial expansion of your original features that's easily computed in real time, and you get uh, non-linearities. So that's almost like handcrafting a kernel. It's in between the two, so you're learning some parts of a kernel. So we do some kind of feature extraction, just not as advanced as other techniques which do, do not have the same real-time constraints. So learning the features, um, we have about 40 original features. As I said, the current URL, uh, time since last visit, and so on. If you want to learn a degree two kernel, you're going to have 780 possible combination of two features. And if you want to learn level three, that's about 10,000. So if you keep all of them, that's 10,000 features you have to compute in real time. So you want to select a subset of them. So what we do is we do feature selection. So for those of you who don't know feature selection, uh, you start with a whole bunch of variables, and feature selection techniques tell you which subset of these variables are actually the most relevant for your prediction problem. So that's what we do, except in our case, so we do it on about 10,000 features uh, on a large scale with a large number of data points and a large number of dimensions. So it's a combination of filtering methods and structured sparsity. So um, feature selection for us is a way of learning uh, a transformation of a data. It's learning a kernel, again, within the constraint that is fast in real time. Ideally, we'd like to expand that to maybe more complex feature transformation, uh, provided that they, they fit within the real time constraint. Um, so these were the. Yeah, um, how am I doing on time? Uh, <clears throat> so I told you the two, uh, well, the one big challenge is how to design a model which can predict as accurately as possible uh, quickly enough. Uh, to give you an idea of the cost of not predicting accurately, uh, was uh, at, some at some point in time we started predicting way too high, and basically the cost is of the order of 700,000 euros per hour. Um, so there is definitely a nice incentive into having uh, an accurate prediction. Okay. Uh, there actually are other challenges I did not mention, and they're not necessarily treated in the academic literature. So for instance, it's nice to predict click, but actually when the advertiser wants to, uh, well, when the merchants wants to do advertising, they do not necessarily want people to come on their website. They want people to actually buy uh, products on their website. So you don't necessarily want to predict if the user is going to click. You want to predict if the user is going to buy. So not only did you didn't have that many clicks, you have even far fewer sales after display. So you have to treat data sets which are hugely imbalanced, where you have the huge majority of the display that do not bring a sale and small, some displays that do bring sale. So you have to find this information into, into the display. But the worst thing is, 
Actually, what constitutes a sale is uh, a sale that occurred within 30 days after a click. So that means that to know if a click yielded a sale, you have, to th you have to wait for 30 days to get your data set. That means in January, you're going to use Christmas data to determine the behavior of user. And that's usually not that relevant. So you have also to take into account that the data you have can be noisy, it's not the entirety of the data, and you still have to be reactive. Another um, issue is basically how much in the past you have to go to learn the model. So of course, you, you'd like to use as much data as possible, but it so happens that the be behavior changes. Um, you can have summer days, winter days, as I said, you have vacation. Uh, just the whole advertising landscape changes over time. So if you do want to use more data, you have to understand how the distribution changes over time. Because when you have the Black Friday, um, which is you know the day after or before after Thanksgiving uh, in the U.S., where there are huge sales, if you, your model has been learned on three months of data, then you're probably going to realize that the Black Friday happened, and you're going to take that into account a week a week too late or something. So you still have to be reactive while learning a lot of data. And then uh, a huge issue which has been started to be tackled uh, mostly by Leon Boutou, uh, which is how to predict the effects of a change in the model. Uh, if I start, if I change the model, if I change my regularization, if I change my model, basically I'm going to start to buy displays that I didn't buy before, and I have no idea what, is, what the performance is going to be on these displays. So it might be that on the data set I have, which was created using data that I got using my current model, my new model is going to do better. But since when I put my new model in production, I'm going to have new data because the two models don't behave the same, then suddenly the performance is not comparable. So this is a standard setting. Uh, people have been using that in reinforcement learning. So basically when your model you put in production changes the current state, it's actually much com more complicated to evaluate these models offline. So. That was for predicting the bid. Now we have to do product recommendation. So we have the list of all the products that a user has seen, and let's say big, big catalogs can contain about 100,000 products. Um, and now, so you have to, in the banner, you have to put the, the products which you believe the user is the most interested in. So there's a whole literature on recommender system. Uh, most of it revolves around matrix factorization, uh, so during the Netflix contest, for those of you who know it, I think it was 2007, there was a whole bunch of techniques to do um, item recommendation. The only issue is that in our case, we have to do it in less than 20 milliseconds. So in the Netflix case and standard matrix factorization technique, what you do is you have a user, you have all the items in your catalog, you're going to score every item in your catalog, and you're going to pick the best, or the best K. And in our case, in 20 milliseconds, we cannot score every 100,000 products in the catalog. So we have to do another kind of recommender system. Again, uh, I'm saying this over and over. Uh, fancy techniques exist, uh, but they do not scale in terms of real-time uh, prediction. So we do have to go back to more standard techniques and make them more complex over time. So in our case, we basically use a two-stage approach. Uh, so the first stage is we go down from 100,000 products to a smaller amount. Uh, for instance, the most popular product, uh, the product the user has seen before. So features, well, products that we believe have a good chance of interesting the user. And then the stage two is we do the exact scoring of these products, because now we have a much smaller subset on the order of hundreds, uh, and we can pick the, uh, the top K products. Actually, it's also a bit more complicated. The first one is, well, products come and go. So when you have, I don't know, maybe sometime soon you're going to have the iPhone 6, uh, you want to be able to propose the iPhone 6 right away. Uh, so you cannot wait until you have enough data to know which items to recommend. And maybe some products only last for a couple of days, and you have to be able, with it, that small time frame, to recommend them. So how do you do that without having to train like, on, on the huge data set? Uh, as I said, there might be a sale, Black Friday, so you have to be immediately reactive to that sale. The Pentis syndrome, uh, so that's something which is well known in the advertising world. I don't know how much it's known outside of the advertising world, that if you want to get clicks, you display Pentis. 
uh, because they have a model with them. So what, what can be seen as funny is actually a more general problem is that uh, you have to be extremely careful about your measure of performance. Uh, if you just want to get click, uh, it's super easy. And that does not mean that these are the most relevant products. So every time you measure your performance, you have to understand why you get that performance and is it truly what the advertiser wants. Because if the advertiser pays you per click and you bring in tons of clicks that are panties because someone just wants to look at a naked woman, uh, you, the contract is going to not be renewed. So you have to be extremely careful about this measure of performance. Uh, another maybe uh, less uh, major point, uh, complementary versus similar products. Um, so that, what that means is You've seen pants, for instance. Uh, I can show you the exact same pants, obviously, and that was what Credo Business was built on a few years back. But maybe you don't want the exact same pants. You want other similar products. So you want, you want to define a measure of similarity to say, you've seen these pants, but maybe you want to be interested in the similar products. Now, what happens if you buy pants? So the question is, if you've seen two pairs of pants and you bought one, maybe we don't want to show the others because you already found what you have. So this similarity, once you buy one item, you don't want to show the other item. However, if you talk about pants and socks, for instance, and these items are often seen similar, uh, together, and if the person buys pants, then you definitely want to show socks because you know they go together. Um, so you have, to, again, to be careful into knowing which products to display and why it makes sense or it does not make sense um, to display them. Um, other challenges for products, uh, multiple products in a banner. So a banner can contain, I think, up to 16 products. Uh, so you can do all kinds of CRF technique uh, to find the optimal combination of 16 products uh, that does not scale well. So how do you do this? Interaction between products and layout. Uh, some products do fit well within certain layouts, or some products you want to display just by themselves. Some products you want to display amongst other products. Um, and also, you have different time frames. So if someone is looking for a cheap item, for instance, maybe you want to show it right away because it's going to be an instant buy. If someone is looking for a house, there's no need to hammer that guy with the exact same house within the next 20 minutes. That's usually not how you buy a house, you know, unless you're certain people. Um, so these are the major challenges. Um, first, recipe for success, and that's definitely something that I did not, uh, well, that you don't necessarily see, let's say, in academia, is that there are many sources of success and failure, and it's often suboptimal to focus on one. So for instance, a trivial thing, my whole speech is based on the fact that you only have five milliseconds to do prediction. And it would be silly to focus on that without focusing uh, on reducing the 95 milliseconds overhead, because if you do that, then you have much more time to do prediction. So you really have to focus on all the products uh, at once. And again, displaying optimal products in the banner, we realized that changing the color of the banner had actually a huge impact. So maybe you should focus on that instead. Or the images of the products. So you know, some images have a white space around them. Uh, so if you do that in a banner, you have a lot of white space and the image is tiny. You crop the image, you increase your click-through rate by 20%. Much more than what you do by any better recommender system. So just make sure you focus on all the aspects of your system instead of the one you know, um, which is sadly a tendency we, we all have. Uh, the conclusion is, uh, prediction is at the core of the, uh, of the creative business, uh, but we have huge en engineering concerns and maybe different bottlenecks in academia, and instead of building the most complex system, uh, we know that, well, I believe, let's say I truly believe that we cannot start from a super complex system and scale it down to make it fit within the uh, time envelope we do. So our approach is really to build from the ground up. Uh, it might not be as sexy at first, uh, but it's really how to get more complex with it, all these uh, huge constraints that we have. Thank you. Uh, so, do we have some questions? Okay, there is a question at the back. Can you raise your hand, please? Guillaume? 
Uh, Nicola, I was uh, wondering, um, I, I can imagine that in France, Disney.com and Guns for Life do not have a high probability of a click or click through, whatever. Um, but I can definitely see other markets where you would have a much higher um, click through rate. Um, can you comment on basically your uh, strategy that are more uh, region uh, limited um, uh, first? And uh, do you, in, in your in your recommendation engine, use a type of uh, randomized techniques. Okay, so I'm not sure I fully understood the first question is, do we have different strategies de depending on where we are and everything? Yeah, okay. Um, so the, the, basic, the, the basic question, well, you have two answers to that question. The first one is either uh, the information is contained, for instance, somewhere else. So Guns for Life, uh, it might so be that the click-through rate is much higher in the US than in France. That doesn't mean that you need to have two different models because one of the variables in the model is, let's say, how many times you visited that website in the last week. And that variable is going to be much higher in the US than in France. So the information that there are different behaviors is already captured somehow. Uh, now the question is, is it fine enough or do you need different models? Uh, you might need different models, but bear in mind that every time you like, have more models, uh, in terms of engineering, it becomes more complicated. So when you want to test things, you have to test them on more models, uh, and it just increases the, the complexity of analysis. And that's something I haven't mentioned, but understanding what the model does, uh, visualize, visualizing, uh, detecting problems is also quite time consuming, so really you want to reduce uh, the number of models because that, increase, that increases the time. Uh, I'm going to be like, yeah, and I forgot the other question. The, the randomization. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, so the thing is, there's something that we call fatigue. That is, if we show the same product to a person over and over again, uh, that person will just stop looking at the ad. Um, so you have to include uh, diversity in the, in the ads you show. So now, whether, uh, how you include this diversity, whether it's by randomization or because you, every time you display a product, you have a rule that says, I do not want to display that product again for like a few minutes, uh, is up to you. But there is definitely an advantage. If you know that a product does not work, you have to see other ones. And that's actually a really interesting topic is that as I said, originally at Critio, we only showed products that the user had seen before. And then we realized that it might not be enough. So we, include, we expand that to maybe similar products. And what if these are not enough? How do, you like, how do you follow the graph? Do you do similar products of existing similar products? Do you do other kinds of uh, metric, well, other types of similarity? So it's really a matter of metric learning and how to, it's also representation learning. You basically want to find the closest examples within a certain representation, and the question is, how do you learn that representation? One more question. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, so you said that prediction is at the heart of Criteo, and I was wondering if you had any of your prediction algorithm, fast prediction algorithm, as a patent, or do you keep it as a secret as for Criteo and uh, you, don't, uh, you don't make it public? So h h what's your strategy? So it depends of what you call algorithm. That is, uh, as I said, an algorithm, if it's logistic regression, well, no, we did not patent logistic regression, though we wish we would have. Maybe not. I don't know. Uh, but the thing is, uh, so we can, we can be fairly open about the kind of models we use. Now, all the back end, all the infrastructure we use to make that actually suited to our, uh, to our problems, that's more secret. Uh, so the point is, we realize that, uh, as other companies have realized uh, before us, that there are problems here that uh, could interest other people, maybe in academia or other, other people, and that would benefit Critio. And it's in everyone's interest to share these, these problems, uh, these data, uh, to motivate that. Um, no, on the other hand, we don't want necessarily to give the entire recipe so that you can code that on your own.
All right. Thank you. I think we'll, we'll stop here with question. Uh, so let's uh, thank uh, Nicolas again. Thanks.